Hello, friends, and welcome to our broadcast. My name is Larry Hutton. I'm your host to Limitless Life, where we learn all about the true life that God wants you to live. He wants you healthy. He wants you wealthy. He wants you wise. He wants you full of His peace. He wants you full of His joy. He wants you living a blessed, blessed, blessed life. That's the kind of life God wants us to live. That's the real gospel. I grew up in religion with a bunch of do's and don'ts, and then I learned the real gospel, the real Jesus. It's not religion at all. It's a relationship with someone that loves you so much that he died on the cross for you, was raised again, and then gave you the ability to receive him as Lord and Savior and have a wonderful life on earth. And then after you leave earth here, get a brand new body, what the Bible calls a glorified body, and then live forever in a new heaven and a new earth where there is no day, night, night at all, just day all the time. It's just, I mean, Revelation chapter 21 talks about the new, after the new heaven and new earth. And it says, uh, you know, if you've read Revelations chapter 20, it talks about the devil is going to be cast into the lake of the bottomless pit and uh, all of his kingdom and everything, the kingdom of darkness. So that's all going to be cast. But then Revelations 21, 4 says there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, and no more pain. Wow, what, a, what an awesome future we have to look forward to. But right now, when you learn this good news that we're talking about, you have a good life you can live right now, regardless of what's happening in government or politics or or terrorist activity or other nations or wars or anything else, you can still live an abundant life. All right, so let's get back to what we're talking about. We started on Monday this series called Resurrection Gems because you can learn some nuggets, some real gems out of studying scriptures on the resurrection, whether it's at, uh, the week before the resurrection uh, Sunday or the, whether it's the week after or whether it's the middle of July or whether it's at Christmas time. No matter when you study resurrection scriptures, man, there's stuff that just really help you live the life of faith and the blessed life. So we've been learning that Jesus' resurrection is different than other people's resurrection. Yesterday, we, we ended talking about how that Satan tried to start a narrative among the Jewish leaders when Jesus was raised from the dead and they found out about it. They paid money to the soldiers who were guarding the tomb and that ended up, you know, when, when that angel appeared the bright light and stuff they fell out and fainted and then when they woke up from being fainted Jesus's body was gone so they went and told the religious leaders well the religious leaders paid them off and started the narrative and it even became writings of history that oh yeah the disciples stole Jesus's body so he really wasn't raised from the dead he's really not the divine son of God because see the resurrection was the only difference from other people that had been raised from the dead. Jesus' resurrection, if he was raised from the dead, would prove he's the Son of God. So we ended in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, talking in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 yesterday. Um, in verse 6, it says, after that, this was talking about other people in the previous verses said they saw Jesus after his resurrection. So he appeared to people. He appeared to the apostles and to Mary and Mary Magdalene, all these different people. And then verse 6 says, after that, then he was seen by over 500 brethren. So 500 people that were not apostles we're not close family members. These are just 500 believers in Jesus. He appeared to them because he knew that they could not do away and just try and erase all these people's testimony. So he appeared to 500, and it said uh, at that point, Paul said they were still alive today. Only a couple, only a few have fallen asleep. So let me paraphrase what Paul said in verse six. Paul paraphrase. Paul paraphrasing. Paul said. There was a bunch of believers having a church service, over 500 of them, and Jesus appeared to them and spoke to them. Now, some of you have probably passed away. Some of them, now, some of them have probably passed away by now, but most of them are still alive today. In other words, there were hundreds of people who were now witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus was also declared in numerous other accounts, including 
the appearance uh, when uh, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20, verses 11 through, what, 18 or so. Then, uh, uh, and that, and by, by the way, that appears there in John chapter 20. Let me look at that. Yeah, that appears to be after the guards had already left. So let's pick up the story in John 20, verse 11. Mary stood without outside of the tomb, in other words, at the sepulcher, weeping. And, she, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, into the sepulcher. She saw two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body had been laid. And they said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Uh, and she said, Because they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've taken him. And she had said this, when she said that, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. She turned around, in other words, and saw Jesus standing, and, but she didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said, woman, why are you crying? Who are you seeking? She, now watch this, supposing him to be the gardener, she didn't know it was Jesus yet, said, sir, if you bore him hence, if you took him away somewhere, please tell me where you laid him, so I'll take him away. And Jesus said, Mary. All he did was say that word that she had heard him say before he ever was crucified. Mary. She turned herself to him and said, Rabbi, which is master. Jesus said, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended to my father. So this is after he rose from the dead, but before he ascended to heaven, right? said, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So Mary Magdalene saw Jesus alive. Then after she left the tomb, Matthew 28, 9 and 10 shows that Jesus appearing to her and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. And then we could turn to these places, but just for time's sake, we won't. Then in Luke 24, 13 through 32, Jesus made another appearance. He appeared to Peter and, and another follower of Jesus by the name of Cleophas. Uh, then in verses 38 through 49, he appeared to 11 of the 12 apostles along with uh, other believers who were with them. Then in John 21... Verses 1 through 14, Jesus appeared to seven of his followers. Five of them were apostles, to the original apostles, but two of them were just followers of Jesus. And then I love the account that it gives in Acts chapter 1. In fact, we'll turn there just so you can see this one in Acts chapter 1, verses 1. Let's start in verse 1. The former treatise of I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. So this wasn't just an appearance here and there, just a couple appearances. For 40 days, he kept appearing to the apostles and other believers and the 500 there and Mary and Mary and just one person after another. And um, speaking, when he appeared to him, it said he's speaking of them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father that you've heard of me. For truly, uh, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. So in other words, don't leave Jerusalem until you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, verse 6, they therefore were come together. They asked of him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times of the, or the seasons which the father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. In other words, what I told you to wait for after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the other most parts of the earth. When he'd spoken these things, while they beheld, in other words, while they're looking at him, he was taken up. And it says a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly toward heaven, as they went up, behold, 
two men, probably the same angels that were in the tomb, right? Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now listen, the ultimate test of credibility for these eyewitnesses was that many of them, listen to this, many of these eyewitnesses faced martyrdom, martyrdom for their eyewitness testimony. This is dramatic. All these witnesses knew the truth that Jesus rose from the dead. And yet if they confessed that before the government and the religious leaders, they could be put to death. So what could they possibly gain by dying for a known lie? In other words, if they were really telling lies, why would they want to die for telling lies? If you had been one of the 500 or some of the others that we've talked about and you were about to be put to death because of your testimony that Jesus was alive, but you know he really wasn't, you would not have died for a baseless cause that brought you nothing. This is evidence, man, that speaks for itself. All of these witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus were not just religious people dying for some fictitious religious belief or conspiracy theory. No, these were followers of Jesus Christ. They were testifying of an historical event that Jesus was raised his resurrection established him as the son of God, like he said. Wow. So let's pick back up to why Jesus's resurrection was so different than other person's resurrections that we've talked about. I'm going I'm to make a statement and then we're going to see the scripture to back it up. It's what happened while Jesus was on the cross that made his resurrection so different. I'm going to say that again. It's what happened while Jesus was on the cross that made his resurrection so different. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go to Acts chapter 10 and let's start in verse number 43. This is actually a resurrection testimony of Peter the first time he was preaching to the Gentiles, you know, the non-Jewish people about the resurrection. In fact, let's pick up the story here in Acts 10, verse 34. All right, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with them. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets, prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Wow. There's a lot, man, you can teach on this whole passage. But I, let me just zero, zero in on verse 43 here. Uh, verse 43, to him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So notice it says to him, and that's talking about Jesus, all the prophets witness. 
That's talking about all the Old Testament prophets, which included John the Baptist, the greatest Old Testament prophet of all. Remember, John was still under the Old Covenant. And so um, Jesus said he was the greatest prophet of all. So Acts chapter 10, verse 43 here says that all the Old Testament prophets prophesied about Jesus. And we know that John the Baptist did. According to Jesus, John the Baptist, look at Ma Matthew 11, 11. Jesus said he was the greatest Old Testament prophet there was. Look what it says, Matthew 11, 11. Jesus said, among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So here in verse 43 of Acts 10, to whom all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him would re receive remission of sin. All of them are witness, all. The word all of them had things to say about Jesus. Every one of them said uh, the same prophecies to that, that led to one conclusion. Look at what Peter said their conclusion was. was. Through his name, whoever believes in him would receive remission of sins. Whoever believes in him. Peter says here that through his name, whoever believes in him. Peter inserted through his name because he was the only living and true God. Paul said that in 1 Thessalonians 1.9. So Peter says through his name so that everyone would know that it's only the name of Jesus that can save. In fact, Peter, when he was preaching to the religious Jewish leaders in Acts 4, in verse 12, he said this, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given, a, excuse me, given among men whereby we must be saved. So again, here in Acts 10, 43, to him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in his name will receive mission, remission of sin. All the Old Testament prophets agreed that you had to believe in Jesus to be saved from sin. In other words, they all said it took faith in Jesus to be saved. And the context of this passage, verse 40, verse 40 says, God raised him up on the third day and showed him openly. That says the res resurrection took place on the third day, which means all the Old Testament prophets said your faith had to be in the living Jesus, not the dead Jesus. The living the Lord, the, the living Messiah, the living Savior. And then verse 43 tells us something else. Look at verse 43 again. To whom all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in his name will receive remission of sins. It says, when you believe in Jesus, you will receive remission of sins. Whoo, glory to God. The Greek word for remission means uh, freedom. It means pardon. It means deliverance. It means forgiveness. It means liberty. It re means remission. All those definitions are from the Strong's Concordance. But I love what the Thayer's Greek lexicon says as well. Remission means release from bondage or imprisonment. Number two, forgiveness or pardon of sins. Letting them go is, is as if they had never been committed remission of the penalty. So literally the word remission means the total cancellation of debt, charge, or penalty. So the Old Testament prophets that Jesus, uh, or the Old Testament prophets that prophesied that Jesus would die for the sins of the world, that he would be raised from the dead, and that anyone who accepted him as their Savior would not only have their sins forgiven, but totally remitted or canceled, completely blotted out as if they had never happened. Wow. Listen, the resurrection of Jesus is meaningless if sin and its penalty had not been dealt with before he rose from the dead. So with that thought, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and becomes the first fruits 
of them that sleep. For since by man came death, by man came the resurrection of the dead. And in as in Adam all die, so even in Christ shall all be made alive. Notice verse 22, in Adam all die. That's not referring to physical death. You have to read the context. What's the next phrase said? In Christ shall all be made alive. That's not talking about being made alive physically. In Christ is the key to understanding that it's talking about spiritual life or eternal life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Therefore, in Adam here means before you get saved and get in Christ, you are automatically in Adam. Every human being is born in Adam. In Adam means we're spiritually dead. That simply means separated from the life of God. Oh, let me hurry up and read Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. We've saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now verse 12, look at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin wasn't imputed where there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Skip down to verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. I'm going to read this from the Weymouth translation. It follows then that just as the result of a single transgression, talking about Adam's, is a condemnation which extends to the whole human race, so also the result of a single decree of righteousness is a life-giving acquittal which extends to the whole race. Wow. Then verse 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. What I want you to see is that Adam's sin passed on to the whole human race, not, of because, not because of each person's sin, but because of Adam's sin. In other words, People are not sinners because of their own sins. They're sinners because they're born into sin. People are born with sin nature. That's why you have to be born again to be born in a new sin nature. And of course, that's what John 3, 7 says. You have to be reborn. That's talking about being reborn without the sin nature. Ephesians 2, 3, 2, 3 says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. Our nature was the sin nature and deserved God's wrath. Somebody might think, but I'm a good person. I live fairly pure life. I don't smoke. I don't cuss. I don't chew. I don't cheat on my spouse. I go to church. I tithe. I pay, da, 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 da. Listen, friend, Isaiah 64, 6 said that all of our righteousness is like filthy stained rags. So every human being needs a nature change. We are born with the sin nature. And sin pays a huge salary. Remember Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Uh, verse 20 says that, uh, that we were the servants of sin. That means we serve sin and we worked for sin and sin paid us wages, which was spiritual death or separation from God. And that's where Jesus comes in. He came to pay the wages or the penalty of sin. He came to bear the sins of the whole world so that mankind could once again have a relationship and fellowship with their creator. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isaiah 53 says, we've all gone astray, but the Lord God laid on us the iniquity, or laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. See, that's what brought us back to what Jesus did on the cross, which in turn brought us life and the resurrection. Isaiah 53, 6, God laid on Jesus the sin, the iniquity of us all. Remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming and he prophesied, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. So uh, that's, what, that's what he prophesied. Peter 
spoke and said, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. So Jesus bore our sins in his own body so that we would be dead to sins and live unto righteousness. Man, we're about out of time. Romans 6, 7, 7 and 8, uh, Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which, doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the righteousness. So this is just, this is awesome stuff here. I'm, I'm going to show you another wonderful truth that was accomplished when Jesus bore your sins and, and then he died and then he rose again. I'm going to show you that in 1 Thessalonians tomorrow's program as we conclude this series of the resurrection and how it enables you to live the abundant, blessed life. Praise God. So again, I wanted to thank you for joining us. And wow, I just hurried so much today. I felt like you'll have to go back and listen and take notes and go to the scriptures and learn each one and say, oh yeah, okay, now I see what you're saying. You may get it the second or third time because I had to go through it so quickly in order to cover everything I want to cover by tomorrow, the end of our series. So thank you for joining us again. Thank you partners for partnering with us. If you're not a partner, would you consider being a partner? Our partners helped you hear the word. Can you help other people? It's so unselfish to become a partner. If I'm helping you, then help us help others. And I know you'll be blessed because our seed is what brings in more harvest. So thank you for considering being a partner. Thank you, partners. Thank you for joining us and learning the word of life, limitless life. Praise God. All right, we're out of time. Have a wonderful Jesus-filled day. If you would like to schedule Larry Hutton to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to LarryHutton.org and choose Contact Us from the menu bar or call 1-888-887-WORD. Do you know yourself? Who you really are? Not the natural carnal person that the world says you are, but the saved, word-filled, Holy Spirit-empowered believer that you really are in the eyes of God. At times, each of us has struggled with our identity, ability, and purpose in our lives as believers. But God's Word is filled with His descriptions of who you really are in Him. In this two-part scripture recording, you will hear Dr. Hutton quote all the Bible scriptures about who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what you can do in Christ. In Him scriptures will help you build and strengthen the very foundations of your faith, enabling you to believe and therefore speak all that God has created you to be, to have, and to do, not in your own power, but in Him. To order In Him scriptures, go to larryhutton.org or call 888-887-WORD. Join us again for Limitless Life with Dr. Larry Hutton where you'll get practical teaching from God's Word that you can apply to your everyday life. Go to LarryHutton.org to watch this program and many others. You'll find special offers and resources to help you thrive in life. You can check on Larry and Liz's schedule and join them at a meeting near you. That's LarryHutton.org, where you can call 888-887-WORD.